So good morning, church. Are you ready to continue your worship? You got your hankies? <laughs> you might need them. Now, we all know that mine isn't the first miracle this church has witnessed in the past few years. The recent ones being Jay Clover, who has recovered from a heart attack, and Randy Spiker, who had cancer and is now in remission. And who can forget my precious friend, Kathy Clark, whom God literally snatched from death's door. I'm entitling this chapter, My Walk to Emmaus Story, and it is found in Luke 24, if you'd like to turn with me. That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he were going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it is getting late. So he went home with them. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Suddenly, suddenly, that's the key word in all of this was suddenly. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. I need to give you just a little bit of my background. I grew up in a Christian home, although it was very dysfunctional. And I believe that there are strongholds on both sides of my family that have kept many in spiritual bondage. God has broken through on many occasions, but I long to see his power manifested in even greater ways. My parents were saved and started attending the West Des Moines Church of the Nazarene when I was five. I remember being very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I gave my life to him at an early age and was baptized at the age of 11. I'm the middle of five children. And my siblings called me Miss Goody Two Shoes because, because I didn't get in trouble like they did. I remember telling my sister that, you know what? If you just shut your mouth, you wouldn't get slapped. <laughs> Part of that was due to fear of getting into trouble with my parents or anyone in authority and disappointing them. This carried over into my relationship with God. 
I never wanted to disappoint him, so I did my best to keep the rules. Then he wouldn't be mad at me. Fast forward to the year 2015. Life was really, really good. Dan and I had recently celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary the year before with over 250 people on the farm celebrating with us. We had live music, which several of you helped with, food, thank you Jeff, and your wife, and lots of fun. There was nothing that could dampen our joy despite the fact that my older sister and her family refused to come. Physically, I was in great shape. I had uh, participated in a 5K run for the first time the year before, and I participated in two more. Dan and I had lost weight, and we were feeling good. I had recently come through a dark period in my life where my two sisters stopped talking to me. I lost one of my best friends, and it totally disrupted my family unit. It took two years for me to come through that, and once again, for God to give me peace. Both of our children were experiencing great pain in their lives and were in a state of crisis. I had retired from nursing to start a home business when I began to experience pain in my right foot. Life became overwhelming, and soon I was descending into a pit of darkness where I would stay for seven years. I became gripped with anxiety and fear. In the spring of 2016, I ended up in a psychiatric ward in Cedar Falls because that was the nearest one with a bed available. During that time when Dan and Rachel would come to visit, I would wail and scream for them to take me home. During my stay there, I began to have visions of hell and its demons. I became convinced that hell was my destiny. The only way to escape those visions was to go to sleep, and so began my dependence on sleeping pills. After eight days, Dan was told to come get me because there was nothing more they could do. So Dan and Rachel took me to a rehab facility up by Chicago, which specialized in eating disorders, anxiety, and depression. Didn't help. During this time, my fear increased, and I began to exhibit behaviors of paranoia. After three weeks of group sessions and therapy, Dan was again told to come get me because there was nothing more they could do. When I returned home, I found Rachel, CJ, Danny, and their dog at my house. Now, we know that according to Dan, farm dogs, if they're good farm dogs, know their place and they're outside. That wasn't the case in this one. But this was the first of many ways the Lord used to stretch and help him grow. By this time, I had lost the ability to concentrate on everyday tasks, such as cooking and cleaning, and Rachel was doing it all while working and trying to care for her own family. When I would get anxious and cry because I didn't know what was, under, what was happening to me, I didn't understand, she would lie on my bed, hold me, and sing to me, it is well with my soul. That was the only thing that ever calmed me. Six, weeks, six months later, after these spells had subsided, they moved back home for the sake of their own family. For many years, Dan and I have hosted an event in the fall called Plow Days for anyone who wanted to get out their antique tractor and plow and have a little fun. That fall during this event, a lady who attended the Denmark church and was very concerned about me, as were many in our community, offered her services to shop and cook meals for us. She was the first of three women Dan hired that God would use to meet our needs. During this whole time, there were only a handful of people I felt comfortable with to allow into my home on a regular basis. I believe my spirit still longed for fellowship. 
Josie Tizer and her family became my link to reality. They would come out at least once a week to clean and share a meal with us, which Josie cooked at our house. And I looked forward to those weekly visits. Due to the intense anxiety I was experiencing, I was unable to drive. So the burden of making sure I got to doctor appointments, therapy sessions, and anywhere else fell on Dan's shoulders. This while he was still working a full-time job and farming, which I was unable to help with. There were occasions when we had to ask for help and there was always someone who was willing to step in, praise the Lord. This whole time, I was very, very lonely and felt not only abandoned by God, but rejected by him. I was convinced that my whole life up to this point was one big lie and that I was worthless because God was no longer speaking to me. Now I know that wasn't true. I just couldn't hear. And I was going to spend eternity in hell without hope and without God. This was a lie straight from that pit of hell. If you are a child of God, there is nothing, nothing, church, that can separate you from the love of God. I had a question and you didn't even have, I didn't have to ask it. Can I get an amen? <laughs> For years, I was unable to attend church more than once or twice a month. As much as it hurt Dan very deeply to go without me, he continued to be faithful to his church and to his God, even when he didn't feel like it. As the fear and anxiety began to subside, I started going with him. Not because I wanted to, but because I feared by my, my not going when I was clearly able to would finally break Dan's spirit and he would leave me. It was also at this time that I began experiencing increased pain in my right foot and I eventually ended up in a wheelchair as many of you have observed. It was just one more chain of bondage the enemy had placed on me. I used it until, through God's strength, Dan said, enough is enough. And he said, at the beginning of next year, I am putting that thing in the garage. This forced me to walk around the house. But I haven't been able to walk long distances and shop until now. The friend that I stayed with this last week suggested I use a cane and I found that it takes the pressure off and I am able to walk long distances. I went from one end of the hospital to the other with my brother the other day when he had some tests done and I went shopping with my sister. I told Dan to get rid of that wheelchair that I no longer needed it. During this time that I felt abandoned by God, I could not pray, listen to music or read the word. In fact, it got so bad, I was repelled by the word and being in church. I have been angry with Pastor Jeff since the first time he stood behind the pulpit to preach the word three years ago because he exudes happiness and joy. His face lights up, not only when he preaches, but in everyday language, which I can now appreciate. He exemplified what was missing in my life, the joy of the Lord. Last Sunday was a totally different experience. I enjoyed being in church and worshiping with my family. I even enjoyed pastor sermon. In January of last year, I spent eight days in the hospital with COVID. Bill Tizer was also there, but sadly he passed away. Due to Josie's loss, she no longer came out to clean. So a social worker at the hospital set me up with a home health agency to help with housework and to assist me with my shower because I was very weak. I used a walker for several weeks after coming home. Eventually, I was able to completely care for myself and do a little light housekeeping, but I still felt flat emotionally. I couldn't cry, I couldn't feel joy, and there was no hope within me. There was nothing, 
that brought me real joy, even though there were many good things that were happening in our family. I was convinced I would die young and wouldn't be around to see my grandchildren grow up. I knew there were many, many people praying for me, but I didn't think those prayers were working. Boy, was I wrong. And I want to stop and thank each one of you for your prayers, your encouragement that were expressed in so many ways, even when I was unable to appreciate any of it. And for the love and support you poured out on Dan. I'm amazed, I am so amazed at the way God helped him stay faithful to himself and to me. He never gave up believing that God would restore me and that he would get back his wife and best friend. Thank you, Danny boy, <laughs> for loving me when I was unlovable and not giving up on me. I literally couldn't have made it through without you. A year ago next month, at Dan's insistence, we started a weight loss program in Keokuk. I didn't want to do it because I knew it would take great effort, but I reluctantly agreed. Up until that time, there were small victories in my life, but I still didn't believe that I was worth being restored or that anything could really change. But there was a stirring deep inside me that at last I had found something that would help in at least one area of my life. Even though I wasn't cooking, it gave me something positive to do as I had to weigh and measure all of our food and keep track of everything we ate, and I didn't have any help. Even though I had to face, even though those things were hard for me, I did them because I knew I had to face Deanna every week, and this provided me with accountability. As the pounds fell off, so did the chains of darkness. So God uses so many different things in our lives. A weight loss program, who would have thought, you know? And it, it's amazing. I have missed so much in the past seven years. Milestone birthdays with my kids and grandkids and being an integral part of this church and its ministry. But just as God sent Moses into the desert for 40 years, he sent me into my desert place for seven years so that when I came out of it, my life and ministry would have a greater impact on those around me than it ever could have before. I began to feel like doing some of the things that I used to do. Last March, I was able to go to Davenport with Dan to what else but a trade show that featured John Deere vintage tractors and equipment where he had one of his tractors featured on the show floor. I realized how important my going with him was, even for just one day. Two and a half weeks ago, the fog started to lift, and I began to experience the desire to care for my home and to be with people, especially my husband. I no longer needed the unhealthy coping mechanisms that I had been using just to get through my day. Unbeknownst to me, I was going to have company this weekend. I'm so glad the Lord gave me the willpower to clean my house. <laughs> Which, it has been a joy to have Dan's family with us. A week later, on Wednesday, July 13th, while home alone, the Spirit of the Lord descended on me in a way that I have never experienced before, and in an instant, in an instant, I was restored. The chains of darkness were broken and I was set free. Amen. Never, never again will Satan be allowed to place me in bondage. Amen. The joy of the Lord was so overwhelming, it was nearly more than I could handle, and I started singing. And my heart has been singing ever since. 
when Dan and I were um, sharing with Pastor Jeff, Dan said, I have my old Lori back. And he went, I don't know if you should say it quite like that. <laughs> so my, my thing, I said, you need to change what you're saying. I'm not the old Lori. The old is gone. The new has come. I am the new and improved Lori Beth to him. Just God. Just God. During those seven years, I know that there was a battle going on in the spirit realm between God's angels and Satan's demons. And I believe it was the prayers of his people that equipped the angels with strength for the battle. But the day of my deliverance, God said to Satan, you're done. I will not allow you to attack my child any longer. And in an instant, the chains were broken, the darkness had to flee, and all fear and anxiety was gone. When Dan came into the house that evening, he knew, he knew there was a big change. But I wasn't really ready to share with him yet because I kind of had to test the waters. So the next day, he was at the church picking sweet corn. And he was telling everybody who would listen that there had been a change. And he said, but the only thing is, she needs to drive. Unbeknownst to him, I was driving. <laughs> I had an appointment in Fort Madison the next day. And I didn't tell him because I really wasn't sure if I could. I not only drove, I thoroughly enjoyed myself, which if any of you know me well enough, you know I like to travel, even by myself. I did a little shopping. And then I began to realize that I could do things for myself and no longer needed assistance in caring for my home and providing meals. So I fired my outside help. Dan said, that doesn't sound very good, like they did something wrong. Well, they didn't. They were wonderful. That is when I knew the work was finished. Not that I have arrived spiritually, because we never will in this world, but deliverance had come. Praise the Lord. Amen. To back up and finish that story, he called me about 10 minutes till 12, and he said, why are you? And I said, I'm still in Fort Madison. He thought my neighbor had taken me to town. And he said, well, when are you going to be home? Because, you know, I have to fix lunch, right? <laughs> and he wanted to wait for me. And I said, oh, about 20 minutes. Well, he was sitting outside at the uh, picnic table when he called me. And when I got home, he said, I walked in the garage and the car was gone. And I said, what is happening? answered prayer. When I arrived home, I started sharing things with Dan about the day before and what had really happened. For years, we had talked about what we would do after he retired and how we wanted to travel, which he did retire last January. But he nearly despaired that our dreams would ever come true. That afternoon, after having lunch, I drove the tractor and baler, which Dan loaded about 400 bales of wheat straw. We were in the field from 2, 2, 2, 2 o'clock till 7.30. I was in my happy place, as I have always found being on the tractor a great place to pray and sing. I will say that after the first load, I about passed out. <laughs> And I have to tell this. And Dan said, you know, he has some water, and I have a chair. We can sit in the shade. And I said, oh, no, that shade is not going to be enough to cool this girl off. I said, we've got to get in the pickup and turn on the air conditioner. And he said, you know, it just doesn't run very well. It doesn't work very well when you're just idling. I said, okay, then you're going to drive, and you're going to drive until I'm cooled off if you want a tractor driver for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> uh, 
Dan was amazed at the transformation he saw in me, and I kept surprising him with what I wanted to do next, such as going with him to Oskaloosa the next day on Friday to district assembly. I wanted to see people I knew and loved and to worship the Lord in the evening service. I wanted to see Dan and Evie Arnold. They had been such good support. I remember Dan calling Dan Arnold and just weeping and the encouragement that he gave. While talking to my Dan later, Dan Arnold told him that he knew when I walked through the door that God had done a work in my life. Healing didn't come for lack of trying. I was reading the word, trying to pray and journaling until the hopelessness gripped me so tightly that I gave up even trying. I tried different antidepressants and saw Christian counselor weekly. I received great advice from people that I trusted, such as Dan Arnold, but nothing worked. When the spirit of oppression was finally lifted and I was completely restored, there was no room whatsoever to doubt that this was all God. I believe that God uses various means to restore and heal us, and I have benefited from the use of antidepressants in the past. But this time was different. God was saying that this was his battle to fight, and he would win it in a way to bring the most glory to himself. Amen. And it was not by man's doing or help. If it had been, I would have been healed a long time ago. People were praying. It should have worked, but that wasn't God's plan. It was totally God, and the medications that I was dependent on were disposed of. God is so good, and he is faithful to deliver his people from the enemy of our souls who came to kill, steal, and destroy. But God is greater than the power of the enemy, and Jesus came to give us abundant life. Life? But not just life, abundant life. He works differently in each of us. Healing may come gradually, in a moment, or it may not come at all while we're walking this earth, but it will happen. Each of us will be made whole when we see Jesus face to face, and the troubles of this world will be gone. So if you're struggling, don't give up. God is at work. He is faithful, and his word promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. Even when we don't feel his presence, that is when we need each other to stand in the gap and pray and encourage one another. Dan and I don't know where we would have been or what we would have done without our church family, co-workers, and neighbors that offered her listening ear and words of encouragement. And some of those friends are here today, and I thank you. There are two experiences that were very humbling. The first was needing help with my shower by a stranger, and this is a pretty independent gal, and that was hard. Although it wasn't long before Brooke became part of my family. She would do whatever was necessary and would encourage me to do things on my own. She was with me as I began to lose weight and was very encouraging. Every week or two, I would say, look, Brooke, I can walk without the walker. Look, Brooke, I can put my socks on all by myself. Or look, Brooke, at how much weight I've lost this week. The other experience was the weight gain. Prior to these seven years, I took care in how I looked. But my first reaction in telling my story was embarrassment. But it's a part of my story. And I no longer feel that way because through this, God receives the glory for what has been accomplished. Right. As
as anyone who has been a believer more than five minutes knows, Satan hates our spiritual victories and wants to rob us of our joy. I was planning to travel to Des Moines to visit my family on Tuesday. The night before, I was in the ER with a possible blood clot in my right leg. They sent me home on antibiotics with instructions to come back the following morning to act on or to get an ultrasound. My, it was negative and my leg was much improved. We had a lengthy visit in the ER, but all the staff were wonderful and I had a great time. <laughs> Dan, not so much. He got a little impatient with the waiting, but I was so calm and peaceful through the whole ordeal. Satan wanted to prevent me from all the good things God had in store for me. But at the name of Jesus, Satan has to flee. And I was able to go to Des Moines to see two of my siblings and share with them what God had done in my life. And I have to back up just a moment. When we were in district, when we were at district assembly, it's a, it's a two hour ride home. And so on the two hour ride home that night, it was though a dam had burst and I began to pour out my heart to Dan. Everything I felt and experienced during that time when I had been unable to share with him or anyone else. As we neared home, I looked over at him and I said, so things are back to normal, aren't they? <laughs> and his response was, that's the most you've talked in seven years. <laughs> One of the things we love about traveling is the freedom to share with each other without the distractions. And no, I don't do all of the talking while traveling, just most of it. <laughs> I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, oh, no, I have to go up. When I was, so I went to Des Moines, and when I was with my younger sister, it was as though nothing was between us. After sharing with my older brother, he told me he didn't believe it was God or a miracle, even though he stated that he could see the transformation. And he was happy for me. And then he thanked me for sharing my story. God's still at work. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I am a beloved child of God and the righteousness of Christ. Just as we earthly parents long to give good gifts to our children, so our Heavenly Father loves to lavish His children with good gifts. I not only feel loved, but I feel spoiled, which is very special to me, having grown up as the middle child and often feeling neglected. And I was because I was the good one that didn't need all the attention and, you know, everybody else did. In the midst of traveling to Des Moines, the Lord provided a mini retreat at my mom's best friend's house, whom we've, I've stayed in touch with and has prayed for me. A leg massage when I got a pedicure, which reduced the swelling in my leg, and it is better than ever and a soak in the jacuzzi tub at my brother's, which I not only enjoyed, but I used to massage my legs. The Lord knows what we need even before we ask. And I could go on for hours, just what the Lord has done in the past two weeks. Just all the little things, just incredible. Another factor in my deliverance was that my spirit was saying, I wasn't, I don't feel like I was cognitive of this, but you know, the Lord through the Holy Spirit communes with our spirit. You know, he, he says that he prays for us even when we don't know the words to say, and he intercedes for us. And I believe that my spirit also was saying enough is enough. And I don't believe that God, he's a gentleman. He doesn't come in and force us to do anything against our will. We have to be willing to line up with him and do what he asks of us. I believe this was the final step 
that God was waiting for to bring about my complete restoration. You may be experiencing a dark time in your life, whether it is depression, family or financial troubles or turmoil at your job. I want to encourage you to hang on and not give up. God hasn't abandoned you. And may my testimony remind you of how important it is to pray for each other because I am living proof that God answers prayer. God is faithful and he is good. Praise the name of the Lord. I've asked my, myself this question, why did I have to go through this? And why did it take so long? And I don't have the answer to that, and I probably will never. But this I do know. I don't really have to know the answer, because God was with me every step of the way. There may be reasons that I will never know. But what I do know is that God is teaching me things that I was resistant to before. And he is teaching me new things as well. And I can look back and see how God was working in my life when I was at my lowest and when I couldn't see it or feel his presence. He is faithful. Praise the Lord. Today I have a new appreciation for the little things in life. A bird song. A comfy bed the sound of my grandchildren's laughter. Now you might ask, why would she say a comfy bed? Because the enemy had robbed me of the very little things that brought me comfort. I had trouble sitting, couldn't cross my legs, couldn't get comfortable. I was, began to experience pain in bed and and I didn't want to go to bed. Before, it had been a comfort to go to bed because I knew I was going to wake up in the morning, have things to do, and enjoy life. But at that time, when I went to bed, I dreaded it because I didn't want to wake up in the morning. I dreaded what was coming. And it was pretty awful. But the grass is greener, the sky is bluer than ever before, and I also have a new appreciation for the bigger things in life, like a faithful husband, friends who love and care for me, a great church, and our community of Denmark. Now that I have been through it, I can look back and see how God was working when I was at my lowest and when I couldn't see it or feel his presence. I want to share my testimony and watch God use me but my greatest desire is to once again be very involved in my grandchildren's lives. When I called Rachel, we video chatted and Danny, our granddaughter, our 15 year old granddaughter was with her and she was so happy. She just started crying. We had a great time. And then later I video chatted with our grandson Dawson who is 13. And he was so happy, he couldn't stop smiling. And he wanted to know how soon I was coming to Kansas. And I said, well, not next week, but I'm a coming. And Marina, Sarah's daughter, who is eight, and Connor, who are six, are getting a brand new Mimi who loves them dearly. And they can't wait to do things with them. They don't know me. They knew what I have been for the last seven years because that's when they came into our lives and I can't wait to share it with them. But most importantly, next to my relationship with the Lord, I have a newfound love for people, including Pastor Jeff. 